Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Haddad. Uh, I work at the Linux Foundation, and today uh, I'm very happy to be here with you to, to talk about improving open source enterprise practices. So the genesis of this talk comes from a lot of discussions I've had with colleagues of mine where um, we look back and we see there is about 20, 20 plus years of experience, enterprise experience in companies uh, joining kind of the open source ecosystem, building projects, becoming part of communities. And the thinking was, you know, how can we distill a lot of the uh, knowledge gained from these practices and pass it to newcomers who wants to get involved as companies in open source and in projects in that part of the ecosystem so that they can learn from all the right things that these companies that came before them you know, did and also learn from their mistake and avoid them so that their curve would be a lot uh, faster in, in this space. So this is where, where we are. Um, I was under the impression the talk was 45 minutes, it's 25 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna be going a little bit fast on some of these slides. So uh, one basic chart, why open source? A lot of the people you know, often refer to you know, faster time uh, to market, uh, leverage engineering development, uh, you know, all of these kind of very practical, tangible ways. Uh, in my thinking, I always think of it really at a, a little bit of a higher level from a strategic perspective. Um, and I identify six reasons here. I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. Um, for us, we look at open source as another tool in your toolbox, right? So you, you work with VCs, you work with startups, you work with incubators, you have your internal, internal R&D, and similar to all of these different pieces, your open source is one tool that you can use to help you with whatever you're, you're going to build, whether in financial industry, in telecom, or consumer electronics, or whatnot. Uh, software is extremely critical. Um, you know, there's the famous, um, you know, um, open so uh, software is eating the world. Uh, today it's open source is eating software. And just to indicate that you cannot really build anything today uh, without using open source. Of course you can, but it's not really a smart move. Why would you want to go create a new open source, um, you know, or create a new operating system or any kind of piece of software that already exists as a collaborative effort, right? Uh, very flexible licensing uh, model, uh, product dependency. So this is actually a chart from when I was running the um, Samsung open source division. And I used this chart every time I was uh, raising money for my group. And it's basically every product we ship uses anywhere between 30 to 70% of open source code in it. So why do we need to invest in this domain? It's because of this chart, right? Um, and then product enablement, it allows us to do a lot of enablement, both direct and indirect, in terms of you know, features or roadmap or dependency. And then uh, somebody earlier today, I heard them talk about the 80-20 factor. Uh, this is really very uh, core to the open source principle in, in the fact it, it, in how it allows you to be more innovative. You know? um, developers in your org are better used to spending their time on the value uh, that your consumers want to go and that's why they buy the product versus buying on spending their time on really enabling stuff. Um, so smart companies today must have an open source strategy and it is, you cannot really avoid that. And it is typically part of a larger software strategy under which you know, open source is a big umbrella. Um, and in the past few years, we've seen a lot of activities around what is today called OSPO, Open Source Program Office. Uh, which is basically the office within a given company that is responsible for um, kind of open source A to Z, you know, whether it's compliance, consuming policies, processes, and whatnot. And um, it grew so much that we actually, at the Linux Foundation, we launched the To Do Group, which is a group of like minded companies uh, that have their own open source program offices. We have about 100 companies there. Uh, it's a free to join and participate, and they have their own events, and it's basically it acts as a knowledge sharing across peers. And one of the interesting thing is every year they do their survey, and I have a few charts uh, through my presentation. Uh, all these, um, the, the, the survey results are available on GitHub, so you can go and fetch them. Uh, so you can see here um, the survey, um, open source programs are overwhelmingly beneficial, compliance, better code quality, better market, time to market, better security, cost saving, and whatnot. Right? So there are obviously a lot of value add in, in these program offices. And what's interesting is these actually offices existed way, below, way back. You know, they had different names. You know, in, in 2005, I was working at Ericsson, and we had what we called the Open Systems Lab. Because we were under research, and our, our focus was how can we bring Linux and open source up to a point where we can really deploy them in telecom environments. 
right? So we were not called open source program offices, a new terminology, but the idea is not really new. Uh, so the phases of open source journey, uh, there has been actually part of Aaron's panel earlier today about you know, how, how companies, where do they start and how do they move. So um, it's really typical for companies to start with consumption. Um, you know, engineers, the developers getting open source code, testing, uh, experiencing with it. If it meets their you know, criteria in terms of functions and whatnot, they start deploying it. And then as a consequence of that, uh, you have to comply. I mean, you ship a product with open source because you know you did open source incorporated. You have to comply. Then th you have the compliance piece, and over time you build that appetite to contribute because you want to influence the direction of the projects you're relying on for your products. You contribute, and over time you're like, hey, this is really working. I want to influence a lot more, and I will want to build a leadership position in the key projects or communities that are critical um, to my product or services. So the first common part is the compliance uh, and consumption and compliance. Um, and uh, what I have here on the chart is basically a lot of the enabling uh, or building blocks so that you have very solid um, consumption and compliance um, uh, environment in, in, the, in, in the enterprise. So of course we need the strategy, uh, a portal for you know, hosting and all the knowledge inside the company, uh, policy and processes. Uh, how do we use open source? Where do we use it? Uh, under which conditions? You know, all of these. Um, and a process to automate all of that. Uh, typically, companies request um, that their developers have permission to use specific um, components you know, under different licenses. And there has to be a process that captures that and document it. Um, you know, um, a lot of education, tooling to be in place for all the automation. Uh, you know, I remember back in you know, early 2000s, I, I was at Motorola and we used to have a Word document going over you know, five, six different people to get the approval for uh, using open source. And that's one document per component. We cannot do that. We're using hundreds and in, in a consumer electronic environment where I was you know, a year ago, it's thousands uh, of components. Um, so a lot of tooling in place and there's a lot of initiatives that companies can get involved in um, to first learn and also to participate and, and, and be um, more influential in specific uh, compliance initiatives or projects. So the next part is participation, as I mentioned earlier. So, okay, we are now at a point where we're consuming a lot. And my advice to, 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 to my teams in the past was, you know, don't go jumping, just contributing. You know, sign up to the mailing list, uh, sign up to the, you know, IRC, to, to the chat, figuring out who's, who's there. What other companies are present? What are they doing? Why they're doing it? Uh, how does that uh, relate to what we want to do? You know, kind of that kind of uh, knowledge, er, learn that knowledge, and then we're ready, uh, you know, equipped with, with this information to proceed into the contribution side. And it's always kind of critical where uh, we have limited resources. Uh, I mean, I, I worked at a company with over 40,000 developers. It's a 300,000 people company, um, and I only had 100 people. So we cannot, with 100 people, go and you know, do everything the company was doing in, in open source. So we had to be extremely selective, and we created basically a process to figure out um, you know, what's the bill of material for all our open source across all products, select the top 25 following a you know, specific criteria, and focus on these. Right? So we have to be very selective. Otherwise, um, you know, it's um, all hell. <laughs> Uh, opens loose in, in the sense where um, it becomes very hard to, to, to prove a lot of impact anywhere. Um, and then once, of course, the company moves into contribution, uh, the contribution space, there's other elements that you need to build within the company to enable that, whether it's a policy for contribution, a process for that, um, uh, educating the uh, community within the company, the developers, uh, you know, supply chain, and, 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 and others on how to work with the contribution side. And there's some different, uh, you know, standard or foundation work that um, you can get involved in to improve that uh, your 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 contribution aspect. And of course, a lot of companies who started early, um, um, you know, kind of paved the way to what we think of today as an open source leadership. Okay, so when you know when you think of IBM in 2000, they announced they're investing one billion dollars in Linux, and then in like 2010, they invested. Um, they announced another billion in open source cloud and so on. So these are kind of the trailblazers. And, um, and today, a lot of companies look at these 
you know, you know, Intel, IBM, the Google, and so on, and say, you know, we want to be leaders in these, in, in the projects that we care about, like these companies are leaders in, in their space. And of course, that requires a lot of investment. I mean, it requires increased headcount in engineering to focus on upstream development. It requires, um, you know, increased headcount in, in legal uh, and, and really across the board, and a lot more focus on where do we spend and, and how, do we, uh, how do we spend that. Um, of course, companies transition. You start as being a consumer, then suddenly you're, you know, you're shipping. You have to comply, and then um, you realize, you know, if this project dies, we're pretty much screwed on our uh, product. So we need to get involved and, you know, participate and keep the community alive and build it and have a thriving ecosystem around it. And you know, it's um, over time you start and then you improve and you transition from one uh, to another. And one thing I found really interesting in the uh, uh, OSPO uh, Open Source Program Office survey uh, was that uh, this chart uh, that states, you know, uh, the financial industry, which is pretty much our host today in a way, um, they are actually a lot more using open source and they're contributing a lot less. And I thought, well, this is perfect because the rest of my presentation is actually on focused on practices that we can pass on to companies involved in this uh, industry. And one thing I'd like to kind of share is that since the 2000s, you know, I was involved in, at Ericsson, at Motorola, at Palm, HP, Linux Foundation a couple times, Samsung. So, and we've had these discussions with a lot of different industries and within different companies in the technology verticals, and everybody thought they're special. You know, at the beginning of times, telecom, you know, the operators and the, you know, the Ericsson, Nokia, Cisco, you know, um, Alcatel, Lucent, you know, these, these kind of Asian, Asian companies now, they thought they're very special, uh, you know, or they're highly regulated and all that. You know, today all of telecom infrastructure is actually based on open source. The mobile came next and then, you know, all the industries started to fall. So finance is not really special. It's just like another kid on the block that just learned about open source and they're trying to see how they can play with it and benefit from it. Um, so, um, so the recommended practices, I actually have 17 of them. I will try to kind of be a little bit quick because that's you know, half a minute per each and then we're done. Um, so uh, there was actually earlier on the panel that Aaron moderated a uh, discussion about open source program offices. Um, so, um, so one of the first practices that I would recommend is to create that office. And I actually just recently, a little kind of self-promotion, um, about a week ago I published uh, a piece on LinkedIn on uh, what is an open source program office? How can you structure it in, in a given company? And there are different ways you can structure it. What are the roles and how can you staff it? Who should be on it uh, for each specific scenario? What are the responsibilities? And what are the challenges they're gonna face and all of that? So if you're interested in this, I highly uh, recommend you, you, know, you uh, checking it out. Uh, and you know, of course, every company is different. I worked in companies where it was part-time, different people, uh, and all the way up to a configuration where you know, over 100 people focused on that. Number two is hire or promote a leader for the open source office. A lot of companies you know, start building up their operation and they go hire from the outside. And I, I urge companies first to look inside. Okay, there, that open source build up that led you to a point where you're ready to go and figure out and think that we need a leader for this position. It's because somebody inside the company or multiple people actually work together to get there. Um, so I'm pretty sure you have somebody from within the company who can help with that. Uh, identify your reliance on open source software. This is one of the um, really important and critical components. Um, and one of the things I would recommend is, you know, we're starting off, um, where, where are we using open source? In which product? In which capacity? How critical is this for the specific product um, and, and, uh, or service? And then build that criticality aspect there where you're trying to figure out, you know, I have this much budget, so many people, where do I put them? And of course, you know, put them on the most critical uh, open source projects from that perspective. Um, and um, uh, one thing as, as a fundraiser, because open source uh, offices or divisions are a cost center. And every year you have to go as the head of the division or the head of the office, you have to go and fundraise for your team. And it really, really helps a lot uh, if the output of your team targets uh, multiple divisions or multiple products. Because in that case, number one, uh, you're able to, um, uh, to get more funding. And if one of the sources of funding uh, changes due to whatever reason, 
uh, you have always a fallback. So as, as a fundraiser for my open source division, I always was very careful in making sure I have multiple sponsors uh, from multiple products and the output benefits at least to each output, you know, each, each functionality I'm creating um, f benefits at least two uh, different parties. Um, and that's, you know, from a fundraising perspective, this is really critical. Um, identify your current and target position. You know, where are we on the map? Uh, are we using? Are we um, just interacting? Are we contributing? Are we opening? You know, where are we on this kind of open source uh, map? And where do we want to get? There are a lot of companies, um, really major companies, who are very happy and satisfied to be being just a consumer, and they don't see an urge or a need for them to go any further. Uh, so it's it's not really mandatory or required, but all companies have to start and go all the way. Uh, it really depends on your business strategy and on, and on your software strategy and open source is just, as I mentioned, is a tool to help you um, execute on that. So identify where you are and wh where you wanna go and then basically chart a path. Okay, I need to do A, B, and C to get from this point to that point. Uh, develop and execute a strategy. This is kind of a combination of a lot of things, including the things I've, I've mentioned earlier. Uh, there are a lot of um, considerations, whether they're technical, uh, related to, developer, to developers, or uh, uh, legal considerations, or kind of specific product consideration in building an open source strategy. Uh, and my, my, my thinking on this is it's always kind of uh, business driven, okay? Um, I'm, I'm very worried when people call me open source guy because I don't consider myself an open source guy, right? Um, I, a lot of times I say no, and I said no a lot of times. And actually, in, in one of the publications I've done uh, in the open source uh, piece, I say one of my favorite things is to say no, because people come to me and they have a lot of requests to open things and move things and, and so on. And my job is to make sure that if we put anything out, I want to make sure that we have the highest chances of success. And if it doesn't meet my criteria for leaving the company, then the answer is no. So, um, so don't afraid. Don't be afraid of saying no. It, it actually you're helping your open source team without them really knowing um, indirectly. Uh, implement an open source enabling environment. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to be put, put in place. Uh, and you know, in the previous chart, I put you know the enabling uh, building blocks for consuming, for compliance, and 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 for uh, contributing. So I will not go too much uh, deep um, in this space. Uh, IT is always an issue. I don't know how it is the case was in the financial industry, uh, but basically in, in any kind of experience I've had before with you know, whether it's small or really large companies, um, the first few months are actually a lot of pain. Okay? You, we're not able to access uh, the firewall. Uh, the, the email doesn't work well with attaching patches. We're not able to access GitHub. We need to get, I mean, there's, it's a nightmare. And it's, in, in one recent case, we actually created our own complete infrastructure for the open source division on um, one of the cloud provider. We had different email address. We were sitting on a completely separate network and everybody was extremely happy. And the cost was like one tenth the cost per month per engineer. Uh, so um, making sure that developers and engineers are actually enabled from an IT perspective, they have access to the same tools, the same equipment that their peers and other companies are working on the same projects. Uh, building expertise. Uh, in different areas, whether it's technical, uh, evangelism, community, strategy, and so on. And um, that's not really hard to do. Um, basically, I would personally start by hiring a couple anchor hires that will help with the education, creating mentoring um, uh, programs, we've done that, um, and basically teaming up with peers in other companies. And there are groups like the Tutu groups and a few others that help with that kind of networking aspect. Uh, where we cannot, as a company, go and hire all the smart people out there. So we need to figure out a way to work with them, and we need to figure out a way to tap into their knowledge and exper experience and expertise so that we can benefit from it in building our own experience in, in whatever company we are. Um, and that's part of kind of, of building that knowledge internally because we're not gonna go and hire every you know, networking whiz to help us shortcut the transaction by a nanosecond or something like that. I mean, you know. uh, create meaningful metrics uh, to track progress. This was mentioned earlier by Andrew, who was on the panel. Um, you know, um, development, um, open source development requires different set of metrics to track. Uh, I'll give you a simple one. Uh, you know, if we have a developer who's tasked by, you know, by us to to uh, improve battery use on on the cell phone, because and then they need to go and improve the 
you know, power subsystem in the Linux kernel. What if it's not that person's patch that fixed the problem, and it's through his, uh, uh, the discussion he or she initiated on the mailing list, he was able or she was able to, uh, you know, they were able to uh, entice other developers to join them on this, and there was kind of a collaborative effort. So would that developer get credit, uh, and as a result of that, get a performance bonus in accordance to that? Well, what if they didn't write any piece of the code, but they advocated for it, right? So there are different metrics, um, and uh, one of the things that we've done, and uh, you know, even at Samsung, was we created kind of a, a, a ladder for you know for open source, and you know you you want to be an open source developer, you go on that ladder, uh, different you know different uh, levels, and it includes um, you know you want to get to a certain position, you need to take training. And this is how we enforce training. You know, you want to you want to graduate to a software architect, which is a really respectable uh, title at Samsung. Um, you need to take the compliance training, the contribution training. You know, there's like ten courses they need to take. Um, so it and it, it works really good. So finding the right metrics will really drive the proper behavior, and any kind of irrelevant metric will just drive the wrong behavior that you would hope for. Uh, create or outsource open source training. I, I mentioned that a lot of company either they, they, they have their own training created internally or they go and you know there's a lot of providers out there that they work with uh, to create training. Uh, open source foundation are very critical. Um, I'm not saying this because I work for a foundation. It's that uh, these foundation hosts very critical projects. Uh, you know, Finos hosts a number of projects. The Linux Foundation hosts close to 200 projects. Mozilla Foundation, Apache, and, and several others. And these projects are hosted in a foundation to provide a neutral home or an open governance structure uh, and to make it very easy and kind of worrisome, really, for companies to get involved in. Um, so uh, in a lot of the projects you're probably incorporating in your builds or in your products, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of them that are actually hosted in a foundation. And one way to influence and, and be part of that discussion is to be on the table by being part of the foundation and attending these meetings and participating in the events and so on. Uh, established framework for uh, open sourcing internal code. Uh, if you work for a large company, you're gonna see hundreds of requests per week to open source. There has to be a way where we can minimize the friction there. You know, if you're, if you, and, and you can structure it any different ways, but you don't want your legal counsel to get 100 requests in their queue by Friday. Okay, to, they have to review. So figuring out a way to structure, for example, if it's just a simple patch, minor, uh, you know, minor bug fix is just the, to the discussion of the engineering manager. If it's a major functionality, is up to the discussion of the director. If there's a pattern issue or open sourcing a new code, then it's, it got to the legal and so on. So figuring out a way to scale the system without burdening the people and kind of creating friction uh, for the developer and for whoever the approvals are. And there are a lot of examples um, from different companies who actually wrote papers and published on how they actually do that. Uh, encourage internal collaboration uh, via inner sourcing. So basically inner sourcing practices are applying open source development methodology within the same company. And uh, I personally see that as very beneficial as a stepping stone in training internal developers who haven't worked on open source on doing and practicing these uh, aspects of development within their peers before they actually step out and start doing that, that, um, uh, that type of interaction with the outside. There's really a lot of uh, uh, publications and, and presentations from different companies and even a lot of uh, groups of companies that got together and, and they're sharing their experience on that. So if you're interested in this, they're easily found via uh, uh, search engine. Uh, participate and host open source events. Um, whether, you know, a lot of these events are actually technical. This is kind of a mix, uh, you know, of strategy, policy, and, and whatnot. Uh, but basically, um, as an engineering manager in, you know, in a previous role, uh, multiple previous roles, I always kind of lobbied to get a budget to send developers to, to events like that. It's really important for them to go advocate what they're doing, um, interact with their peers, their developers, other developers working from other companies on the same project, and building these relationships. Uh, and of course, hosting events. You know, most of us don't use their offices past six or seven p.m. You know, staying there for two two hours more to host, uh, you know, a Python meetup or you know, uh, you know, whatever kind of project meetup is is extremely helpful to know people, to hire people, right? And uh, just kind of building up that reputation. Uh, establish R&D projects with university. I've done that a lot of time. Actually, open source is a great uh, vehicle for these collaborations because. You know the output is open. It's licensed under a license that anybody can use. 
uh, and it gives you a tap into shaping you know, kind of the, the next generation talent that you can hire from and can you know, give you a new perspective on your product and services. So we've done that uh, a number of times with like, you know, Stanford and, and many other kind of top universities, and they actually came up with some really cool things that we never thought of before. Just, you know, very, very positive surprise. Um, uh, update outsourcing um, um, agreements and M&A. This is especially important, uh, you know, so you would have a very good control on what kind of code is coming to you. Okay, in the past, most of these agreements were, you know, you're getting code that was created by the software provider. Today, any kind of delivery you get from a software provider might include deliveries they got from like 50 other open source projects. So we need to make sure that they provide all the uh, notices and basically all the disclosure in relation to open source, and that requires updating all these outsourcing agreement. Okay, and uh, same thing for any M&A practices. And there were a couple of presentations earlier on uh, M&A audits. Uh, formalize uh, open source career path. We, I mentioned, you know, I talked about this briefly um, earlier. Oh, I'm going too fast. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so, th so these were 17 practices. That, of course, I'm pretty sure there are more. If you talk to other uh, open source practitioners who've been doing this for a while, they can add a lot to this. Um, and and I think so. We talk on you know these are the good things that you can adopt really in, in how you're th formalizing open source uh, in an enterprise uh, setting. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is challenges. There's going to be a lot of challenges, and I was kind of trying to wrap my hands around it, and I figured it out they would, most of them, fit five different buckets. So cultural challenges, and of course, you know, I have um, you know, specific ones under each category. Uh, processes, um, tools, continuity, and education. Um, and as, as a leader for the open source division or, or group or OSPO in, in your organization, you're gonna be hit by these on a daily basis, by multiple of them, and on a daily basis. Uh, and what's really advantageous to you today uh, if you're entering and you're aiming to build that, is you can look back at hundreds of companies who've gone through that before and see how they solved it. And there are, um, actually at the Next Foundation, we published a book on that. Uh, it's a f free ebook that you can download um, where we talk about each of these individually and what is the path to help assist you in, in addressing these different challenges. Um, so there are a couple of references I'd like to point you to. The first one is a to-do group. Uh, they published maybe 10, 12 different guides uh, focused on different, you know, consumption, compliance, contribution, building a community, and, and, and so on. They have, I think, 12 plus of such guides, and also an ebook on open source, um, uh, enterprise open source, basically building an open source um, uh, operation within a given infrastructure. Uh, I'm sorry, within a given company. Uh, so there's there's really a lot of literature that is available out there, um, and it's you know available for free. Um, so this this was on a fast forward 20 25 minutes. Uh, I'm happy to stop and take um, take your questions, and I'm you know I'm here for the rest of the day as well. Yeah, thank you.